Chapter 5 Little one, come on in. She pivoted to confront Clint. His jacket and tie had vanished, but his suit pants and white shirt remained on. His appearance was terribly alluring. As they ascended the stairs, she muttered, I was just watching the car. She felt the chill creep up on her once more, and without thinking, she slid her icy palm into Clint's, like a weary child trying to find warmth. His hand tense for an instant. Then it coiled itself around hers, strong and lean and squeezed. He said, what's wrong, honey? She gave a head shake. I had the impression that I had known him previously. I could sense that something wasn't right. Grinning, he led her into the house and then into his den, asking, deja vu. She let out a shrug and slumped into the couch. I suppose. I'm not sure. I was afraid of it. She observed him filling a neat whiskey glass with ice, then tossing it back. Tell me about him. Moving across the room, Clint dropped to one knee next to her, his darkening eyes nearly level with hers. As they landed in her lap, his hands clasped hers. He remarked very sweetly, He's got cancer, honey. He informed me he only had fewer than two months left, and there's nothing they can do for him. She let out a sob, and tears streamed down her face. She smiled palely and muttered, I like him. I concur as well. Johnson is an amazing individual. I spent the most of my life with him. Taking his handkerchief, he dabbed at her eyes. You know, in his 42 years, he accomplished more than most men do in a lifetime. He didn't let a moment pass. For a man like that, Grieving too much is difficult. She took a long time to look into his silent eyes. She spoke a quiet, I... I can't picture you grieving for anyone. You can't, my dear? With a gentle smile, he moved his hand to remove the hair off her damp cheeks. Do you still believe that I am impervious? I'm not sure. She looked at his quiet, dark face for a long moment. I have very little knowledge of you. I had no idea you were a fan of country western music. I enjoy all genres of music, and the crazier the storm, the better, he said softly, and sensitive young women with liquid jade for eyes. And little darling, I would grab your mouth and make you beg for mine if you weren't still holding on to the kiss Johnson gave you in the car. She attempted to control her breathing, to hide the impact those gentle words had on her brittle feelings as she flushed to the base of her hair. She struggled to summon even a tiny bit of outrage to turn against him. I, I might not even, even like it, she answered, his eyes piercing into hers. He murmured softly, you've spent the last four years wondering how my mouth would feel on yours. Both of us are aware of that. She stood up shakily and walked around him in the direction of the door. His question was met with her hand reaching for the doorknob. When are you going to stop running from me? She answered, dismissing the query. Good night, Clint, he snarled. Don't fall on your way to the nursery. It was only fitting that he should be foiled because she could taste the bitterness in those cruel words. For sheer arrogance, he was superior. Margaret. She froze at the sound of her name, so foreign and odd, coming from his lips. She turned to see an incomprehensible expression on his face. Next time, come ride with me, he urged softly. I'll go you down to that small creek branch where you used to go wading with Jana. She paused. Why? She inquired. Carelessly, he continued. Maybe I want to get to know you again, she asked. Did you ever know me? He gave a head shake. I'm starting to believe that I didn't. Are you coming? She bit her bottom lip. I will if, if Brent isn't home. His jaw muscle tensed, causing his eyes to narrow. He spoke tensely. Brent isn't coming back. He instructed me to ship his bull to Mississippi when he called you while you were away. He is en route to Hong Kong. I see. She looked aside. Don't look so damned lost. How many men does it take for you these days, Irish, my God? 
he gave a fierce snarl. Why is it important to you? She fired back. When she went upstairs, he had still not responded. At the breakfast table, he was waiting for her. His chest was covered in a red-knit shirt, revealing his curly dark hair and bronzed skin just below the V-neck. His light eyes briefly met hers before settling on the pale blue top she wore over her blue pants. At the nape of her neck, where her hair was fastened, they narrowed. What made you pull your hair back in that manner? Quietly, he questioned. She said, settling in at the table, it gets in my eyes when I ride. Sweetie, how would you like your eggs? From the kitchen, Emma called. Emma, none for me. This morning, she called back, just for coffee. Absent appetite? Clint chastised. She raised her gaze to meet his. No, she murmured in a voice that even she could not have heard. He grinned and peered at her through the edge of his coffee cup. No makeup, he inquired calmly. She observed as the silver strands in his hair caught the light and began to burn. I have not yet put it on. With a somber expression, he held her eyes across the table. Avoid it. Its taste doesn't appeal to me. Maggie protested with her lips parted, but Emma entered the room carrying a steaming cup of coffee to which Maggie paid her full attention. It was the ideal morning for a leisurely equestrian ride. Under the massive pecan trees that shaded the expansive orchard, not even the scorching heat was felt. The neat rows in which they had been planted so many years prior never ceased to impress Maggie. With a mumble of inattention, she wondered how old they were. The foliage? Clint grinned. It's a reality that he is older than any of us. Grandpa, speak for yourself, she answered mischievously. With a spiteful look in her direction, he pulled his hat down over his brow. Maggie, you're in danger. She joked, I'm not afraid of you. Your elderly bones are so fragile that pursuing me would likely shatter them. He stared at her as he reined in his stallion. He informed her, I think Brent had a point. Tomorrow morning, how about 50 paces with guns? Are you certain that you have enough hand stability to carry a gun? How dare you? He chuckled. The years almost vanished as she laughed back. She yelled, race you to the meadow, and planted her heels against Melody's sides. As they rode toward the woods across the verdant pasture sprinkled with wildflowers, she felt she had the better of him. But Clint passed her before she could get to them, like the little mare she rode was backing up. She felt sadly that no one could match him at this. He was an exemplar of masculine grace and force, a master horseman who was practically a part of the horse he rode. How have you been? She reined up beside him as he asked. He was about to start a cigarette when he stopped to smile at her red, angry face. A bitter loser. She gave him a dirty look. Why is winning required all the time? With a casual reply, it's my land. Her gaze swept across the verdant, verdant grassland, out to the distant fences and the herds of cattle that resembled little red and white spots. It's lovely she whispered gently. He reminded her that she hadn't always believed so. You were correct, too. There are disadvantages to ranch life, Maggie. Not much excitement or nightlife around here. It can become quite isolating at times. She smiled miserably and asked, Is that how I strike you? A nightlife enthusiast from the city? He peered over his cigarette with narrowed eyes. Unquestionably a city girl. You were always, she allowed her gaze to follow a bright black and yellow butterfly flying nearby. I appreciate how well you know me. An explosive stillness fell. Why do you live in the city if you detest it so much? The quiet rage in his words made her cringe. What other options did I have? I am only proficient as a secretary. She gave him a fierce look. In case you forgot, there aren't many jobs available for female cowhands, she said coldly. 
Or is it that you just never notice that I'm not a boy? Humor sparkled in his eyes. The fact is, honey, I never really thought about it. She gave the mare a gentle pat on the flanks and nudged her into a walk. Thanks. More of a fire road than a trail, the passage through the trees was wide enough for both horses to go side by side. The sound of softly flowing, bubbling water and the gentle sway of the pines in the breeze were the only sounds to break the mesmerizing silence. Clint said that in this manner, his horse would take a narrower, less obvious route. She trailed after him to what appeared to be a dense undergrowth wall. He got off of the saddle, tying the stallion while gesturing to Maggie to rope the mare a few yards away. It felt like a step back in time as she stepped forward into the small clearing while he held back the branches for her. It was the little brook where she and Jana used to spend dreamy summer afternoons splashing and eating a picnic, as pure, delectable, and sandy as ever. Standing beneath a low-lying oak, he warned her to watch where he walked. Cattle have mucked in that soft sand before. She sat down to take off her boots and socks, glaring at him. Should I kindly moan? Will you take me out? With his hands beneath his head, he leaned back and smiled beneath the hat's concealing brim. I could. She delighted in the sensation of the cool water on her bare feet, the musty scent of the sand and silt, and the fragrant wildflowers blooming along the banks as she wade into the crystal clear stream. He said idly, I used to come here when I was a boy. It widens a few yards downstream, which is where I learned to swim. And, I'll wager, capture spring lizards and tadpoles as well. He said, nope, just water moccasins. She came to a complete stop. Here? She questioned. Yes, it was once teeming with them. Chills washed up her arms. In the middle of the stream, she froze and glanced around cautiously. All the slender sticks she saw suddenly turned into hissing enemies. Clint, she said, what do I do if I see one? When Jana and you first arrived here, what used to you do? We never did see any. Just lucky, he said. Before lowering it once more, he raised the brim of his hat and gave her a quick glimpse. Maggie, you best flee like crazy if you do see one. Naturally, it won't accomplish much because they are swift snakes and have a history of pursuing humans. Before he finished speaking, she was seated next to him, holding her socks and boots. He laughed heartily. He laughed. My God, I was playing around. She murmured, you know how afraid I am of snakes. He said, I think I have a pretty good idea after last summer. Ignoring him, she used her socks to dry her feet. He inquired, what did you do for entertainment in Columbus? She wrapped one of the socks over her palm and fixed her gaze on the water's diamond-like shimmer. She gave a shrug. The majority of my time was spent tilling the backyard and starting springtime plants. I like fishing on the Chattahoochee River throughout the summer. I used to go to the mountains in the fall with a few other gals to see the leaves change. I used to take the drive up to Atlanta during the winter to see the ballet or the symphony. She looked at the balled-up sock. Boring things of such nature. You can't bear classical music, I'll wager. He said, I do, in fact. Even yet, I prefer the works of the classic masters, such as Dvorak, Debussy, and Beethoven. A lot of contemporary pieces don't appeal to me. Gazing at the hat covering his face. Sarah mentioned that you enjoyed westerns. Yes, I do. And easy listening. His hand was hopelessly searching for a cigarette in his shirt pocket. Like you, little daughter, I enjoy painting. I used to travel to Tallahassee only for exhibits. She cried out when the King Tut display arrived. He broke in, and I saw it. With eyes a deeper green than the leaves on the tree above, he removed the cap and threw it to one side as he lit a cigarette and gazed up at her. Take off your hair. That's not how I prefer it tied back. She pouted. You just want it to flop in my eyes so I can't see. But she nevertheless unwrapped it 
and allowed the black waves to softly fall to frame her face. Stretching out a long arm, he tested the softness by catching a thick strand of hair with his fingers. Long and silky and thick, he whispered softly. Satin black. She appeared to be having trouble breathing. Her gaze strayed to the trunk of the tree behind him. Breathlessly. Do you still like to hunt? Was her question. Just dear, he muttered. Did you realize that your eyelashes are practically too long to be real? She took a nervous breath. Hadn't we deserved to, Clint? Aspired to what, his beloved? He inquired gently. Her eyes widened in something like shock as she met his silent, searching gaze and lost the rest of her breath. He threw his cigarette into the stream and started pulling her toward him without taking his eyes off of her. With trepidation, she mumbled, Clint, placing her small hands against his large chest and sliding herself back into the pine straw and dry leaves that covered the hard ground. His thin fingers traced over her face, softly probing it in a quiet that pulsed with restrained passion. What are you scared of? He inquired carefully. She trembled and muttered, you, as his fingers stroked her mouth, her high cheekbones, and her nose. With a questioning expression, he questioned, why, Maggie? While he ran his thumb over her lips, parting them and feeling their smooth texture. Her eyes closed hopelessly as her heart raced beneath the gentle, wonderful pressure. Only the soft swish of the tree limbs with their long gray beards of Spanish moss and the irregular sound of her own breathing broke the stillness, which was as pristine as morning. She felt his strong, chiseled mouth contact her closed eyelids as his slender fingers penetrated the soft hair at her temples, holding her flushed face firmly. She felt a wave of sheer ecstasy course through her skin as his massive chest lowered itself gently against her. Little girl, don't be afraid of me, he whispered into her ear. I'm not attempting to woo you. She blushed and swallowed anxiously, feeling the vibration of his quiet, deep laughter against her. Her tiny hands were on the warm muscles of his chest, pressing against the thin cotton shirt. His lips, barely apart, stroked her chin, the gentle curve of her jaw, and her high cheekbone. Ignorantly, he muttered, Unbutton it. W what She succeeded, lost in unfamiliar feelings. He breathed at the corner of her mouth. My shirt. Her thin hands coiled around him. I... I can't. She trembled in a whisper. He whispered softly. Don't you want to touch me, little innocent? That evening in the pool, you did. Until you became aware of what you were doing. Clint, you have to... She groaned. He moved his mouth to position it slightly above hers, so close that his warm, smoky breath mixed with hers as he muttered, Hush. She tilted her chin up as his hands glided across her face. Now, little girl, I need your mouth beneath mine. Soft, warm, and delicious. She trembled at the look on his face as her eyelids briefly opened to see him. She tremulously muttered, Clint. Tell me you want it, he said in a hushed whisper. A tear welled up in her throat. Clint. Oh. She dreamed of nothing more than the gradual, excruciatingly tender taste of his lips brushing against hers in a kiss. She vaguely felt his fingers cup her head as he started kissing her, and she felt him tense as he did so, slowly deepening the kiss until it abruptly grew from a tiny spark to a roaring blaze between them. The anger of it caused her to let out a cry, and her hands shook as they reached up to grasp the wide shoulders above her. Clint. Clint was teaching her a lesson in ardor that nothing could ever erase from her mind or her heart. Clint was the guy who taught her to ride, who teased her, and who broke her young heart that unforgettable summer. And it was Clint who was loving her. 
Suddenly, he pulled his mouth away from hers and gave her a downward glance that appeared to be filled with green smoke. In a languid, palpable silence, one thin finger traced the gentle, slightly bloated curve of her mouth. He said, Margarita Donahue, his eyes meticulously tracing every feature on her face. You could write what you know about making love on the head of a pin. Her gaze snapped down to his chest. She spoke firmly. I never pretended to be sophisticated. I apologize if I let you down. Could I please get up now? You didn't disappoint me, he added softly, pulling her reluctant face up to his. She could hardly see him through an irksome mist, and she detested the burn in her throat. I have no idea, she muttered pitifully, that it makes for a hell of a change, he told her, smiling patiently down at her. I'm used to smart, sophisticated girls, not cute, helpless young children in need of guidance. Her fingers instinctively reached up to grasp the tight, hard mouth and its sensual curves. He carelessly kissed her fingers, his own reaching up to his shirt's buttons and snapping them open. He took hold of her curious palm and drew it down into the aperture, against the strength of curling black hair and warm, slightly damp muscles. She gave a scream and wrenched her hand away, as though the momentary contact with his flesh had scorched it. His eyes narrowed and his black brows furrowed. Is even that too personal for you, my god? He snarled. You cursed little icicle. Do you really believe that a guy might get sucked into an uncontrollably passionate web just by touching those thin, untrained little hands? The rage in his deep voice made her cringe. With a calm demeanor, he rolled away from her and sat up, placing a cigarette between his lips before lighting it. He said roughly, Put on your boots, little Miss Purity, and I'll see you safely home with your honor intact. I'm sorry, Clint. Please don't, she sobbed. You paid attention to me. He stood up, slamming his hat onto his head after swiping it from the ground. He left her to follow and made his way to the horses through the undergrowth. She fought back tears as she pulled her boots on over her wet socks and walked naively toward the small mare. Taking no notice of him, she swung onto the saddle. She abruptly broke into a gallop by turning her horse and kicking her silky flanks. Maggie, huh? Clint gave her a call later. With her fingers gripping Melody's silky mane, she leaned over her neck and gave her a reckless shove. Her only desire was to escape from him, so she coerced the mare into running in a state of extreme fear. It happened so quickly. She was fully in charge one minute. The next, she saw a sliver of green grass and blue sky before her body trembled to make touch with the hard earth. She had a hazy memory of being touched harshly, and hearing a voice screaming out to her. She felt her head aching and was too tired to respond. She moaned and opened her eyes, seeing the sky and Clint's taut black face in hazy focus above her. His eyes were terrifying as he glared at her. You damned little fool, she managed a long-winded murmur. I fell. He snarled viciously. And it's too damned bad you didn't break your stupid neck. Maybe I could do that for you. What hurts where? Her mouth quivered nervously. My head, she whispered. His hands caressed her defenseless form, instinctively searching for pauses. There was a pallor about his mouth that suggested strain, and his face was lined as she had never seen it before, highlighting his older age. And Melody? She got out. She's all right, was the terse reply. No thanks to you, he continued. That was the last straw, so to speak. Anguished tears started to stream down her cheeks, causing her chest to tremble in response to the repressed sobbing. I'll hit you, Maggie, if you cry, so help me, he menacingly said. She sobbed. You, you big bully! I detest you. That is not new information, he responded gently. He lifted her up against him by placing his arms beneath her knees and back, 
Can you stay on Melody till we get home if I put you on it? Yes, she said resolutely. To spite him, she would hold on until hell froze over. He replied softly, We'll go slow, and skillfully lifted her aboard the little mare, making sure she held the reins securely in her hands. Are you able to attend? Her green eyes were angry as she gazed down at him. It's a sure thing, she said coldly. Ignoring the ice and the wrath, he flung himself onto the saddle. Come on, let's go. When they arrived at the ranch house, she was drenched in sweat from the longest trip she had ever experienced. As she swung uncontrollably on the saddle, Clint reached up to grab her and dragged her upstairs, calling out for Emma all the while. What in the world? Emma worriedly inquired. Clint exclaimed angrily, Annie Oakley fell off. As I give Dr. Carey a call, stay with this dumb child. I hope you stumble and go flying down the steps. Maggie, breathless and disheveled, uncomfortable and unpleasant on her bed's coverlet, called after him with tears in her eyes due to the dampness. Emma took a seat next to her and brushed the strands of hair out of her eyes. Oh, dear baby, she crooned, her expression a silent one of sympathy. Does it hurt a lot? She buried her face in Emma's apron and started to cry. She sobbed. I hate him. Oh, Emma replied softly. I know, I hate him too. I have known forever. Maggie, men can be so cruel and blind at the same time. More than most, that one. He's never shown me any interest in women. It appears as though he is fearful of becoming overly attached. You know, even Lida was a physical being. Everything with him is physical, she sobbed. Emma remembered his father lovingly caressing her mother's dark, wavy hair as he smoothed it over her knee. Though she was fond of him, Mrs. Collins was never able to return that love. Maybe there was really too much of an age gap. However, Clint became affected when he recognized that his parents' marriage lacked harmony. My sweetheart, love is a word he doesn't comprehend, she murmured. I apologize for the many years and sorrow it has taken you to realize this. Oh, Emma, she said in a whisper, so am I.